Welcome to the Latvian Football Podcast, where today we are going to look back at the second qualification round of the UEFA Conference League, which is an exciting time of four teams from Latvia participating. Well, some good things, some bad things, some expected, some unexpected. What happened during this time? As you said, there are all four of the Latvian teams competing in the same round. I don't really recall if it has been really happened in the previous few years so that was definitely a very exciting time and yeah two of them got through two of them didn't and uh, we can start with the first one Valmir who started in the Champions League qualifiers uh, lost out to Ljubljana's Olympia and uh, now they're in the Conference League and went against this uh, how do you I think Sam San I, Samarinese. Samarinese Giants. It's like with a double M. S- yeah. Samarinese, for, yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah, Giants Trepen. Of course, Giants is... Uh, I'm saying it ironically. The matchup ended just 10-0. Easy, easy win for Valmir. And I don't even know how what much to say about the games because it was just Valmir playing against am- am- amateurs and it could have been, I, I think, it's like... Top half of the uh, Nakwatnes League could have put up a better performance against Valmir than Drepena did. And then, uh, yeah, they were bound to win. But uh, I think it's even more, actually more interesting to talk about Valmir's you know, squad and internal processes than uh, the actual game. But, uh, of course, let's start with the game briefly as well. 3-0, 7-0. Even though they won both games confidently, the first one was a bit, I wouldn't say shaky, but they should have and could have scored more. And just didn't seem that confident. But again, it's hard to sort of prepare yourself when you're playing against such a team and just try and be, well, well, execute the tactics and trying not to be too selfish or whatever because you know you're better than the opponent. Uh, but then again, it was away at San Marino, so that that's also, of course, a factor to take in. Yeah, men scored two and Doi won three nil. Well, what else can they do other than just attack, attack, attack? Yeah, and that's what it was. The most noteworthy thing about this game is this was Valmira's first ever European win. And on that we congratulate them, uh, finally. And I feel like maybe, uh, I mean, I, I feel like I sound like a broken record with saying that uh, Valmira seems to have it all in their heads when they go out and play in Europe. But, I mean, maybe a win as resounding as this, especially in aggregate, uh, a thoroughly dominant performance, maybe that will a little bit improve things. Because, yeah, first game, also watched it. It was very good to have the opportunity to stream from San Marino. Um, and uh, actually, commentator doing pretty well pronouncing Latin names. Uh, gotta give it to, to them. Uh, Valmir dominant, but uh, yeah, a little bit... A little bit uh, cautious, maybe, or a little bit more conservative than they should be. Second game, just uh, complete destruction. By ninth minute, I mean, it was all over, if there were any doubts about it after the first leg. And so on aggregate, essentially Valmir went from, in four years' time, not winning a single game in Europe, to winning their first game, 10-0, which is... Pretty cool, I think. Yeah, and uh, now looking back at it, it makes sense because Trapana were just just awful. Well, it would, it's just, I can say it as it is, and the uh, teams from San Marino never <laughs> win these games. I say teams, it's, all, it's always just one team even going in the qualifiers. But um, yeah, it's... it's, it's uh, I didn't expect a 10-0. I can honestly say that. I thought, Easy, like comfortable wins, like three nil, four nil, for both games, but not not seven nil. Especially four goals in twelve minutes. That's all. That was also quite quite crazy because if if there's ever a time when you're a much weaker team than the other one to sort of try and defend and some do something right, it's the first minutes, and usually you can see it about like in the twentieth, thirtieth, and then it sort of starts to fall apart. But this time for Trapana. Already in the third 
third minute, Tony Shows was the goal scorer. I think it was his first or second goal for Almer only as well. Uh, now that he scored two that game, yeah, it, it just seemed too easy for them. And yeah, it was uh, also nicely finished off by Anzems with a beautiful free kick in the pretty much last moment of the game. But also noteworthy to say is that not only the first game was the first win in Europe for Valmer, but also the last game for certain players of Valmer, which is, uh, well, it, it really is a shame because it, I think it was pretty much the two best players that that played their last game, Mena and Jalisco. Uh, now went to Lechia Gdansk in Poland, Poland's second division, although it's a Polish giant, where, of course, we wish them all the best of luck. However, it's a bit of a shame, because if they were still in Valmiera, I'd be much, much uh, more hopeful um, for their fixture, next fixture against Partizan. Now, now I'm really not that sure. Well, you, you weren't that sure about this one either, in all fairness. And I, I do recall you saying that uh, Trepene being um, such an underdog might uh, might end up very unfortunate for Valmir. But no, we t- we talked about it last time. So just a reminder, the person who owns Valmira has now also gotten a share in Lekia Gdansk. And basically, last time you said on the podcast that, well, he has like a new toy and then you sort of backtracked a little bit. But, well, I mean, maybe you really weren't that far off because, yeah, essentially some of Valmir's best players, uh, that, that Bosnian guy who played one game against uh, Ljubljana, like he went after two weeks in Valmir and now basically immediately Mena, Jalisco, two of some of their best players are gone and there's uh, rumors that Jaunzems might follow as well, although that hasn't been officially announced yet. And essentially, Valmira, in so far as I'm concerned, is just being gutted and and uh, taken apart for spare parts for Lechia Gdansk in Polish second division. Obviously, very keen to return to extra class, but I mean, come on, it's just rude to Valmira and the fans, and to, the team is already struggling this year. And they're the champions, the reigning champions. Obviously, no no chance on defending that title before this, but especially now. And it's just, if I was a Valmira fan, I I would feel, I think, uh, I think I'd feel quite betrayed of that kind of treatment from club ownership. Yeah, if you have a bigger toy to play with, shouldn't just fully neglect the other one. At least give some players back or, or something. Or at least wait until the end of the European season. Then again, I get it because it's the football is a business for him and it's important to sort of... Well, he can't really let the players play out the Europe, European games because the Polish season also starts and then they need to sort of be fit and gelled into the team. So, I, of course, I get it, but it's just sad from our point of view because we want Palmer to do well and and, uh, yeah, if if Jaunzems goes, then it's really just wraps for them because Jaunzems definitely now the best player, and the way he's been playing the last few games has been well for me. I just really like him and like how he plays. Without him, yeah, it's it's tough to say what what happens with Valmir. Realistically, if they could even you know lose out on a European spot next year and finish fifth, and that's not what we want to see. Well, I, I can't say it's not what I want to see because there's three teams competing for two spots. All of them sort of deserve it, but um, Valmir is, uh, is, is a likable team. And as you said, it's uh, yeah the way they're being gutted out, as you're saying, it's just yeah sad to see. I mean, the result between first leg with Mena and Jalisco and second leg without them, um, I mean, is... is rather significant 3-0 versus 7-0 of course that doesn't mean much in its own right but if if you're a football romantic I suppose you could dream that well with these people leaving maybe it will be uh, uh, the time for as uh, Valmir coach put it earlier in the season for his green tomatoes to ripen up step up and uh, and open up but uh, I think that that would be just uh, that would be a little bit too naive 
we'll see what happens to Valmir. They're currently in third place in Virsliga. But, I mean, it is what it is. Team is being reconstructed, whether they want it or not. True. That That's true. And on this note, uh, we... <laughs> I guess we talk about RFS versus Saba or Shaba. I heard both. So, first fixture took place on 26th of July, return leg on 3rd of August, as most of the return legs did. First game RFS played at home, well, in Latvia, in any case, and uh, bizarrely lost 2-0. Um, I was there, and I can tell you that the mood after the game was mournful. It just seemed unbelievable how, with the amount of shots produced, none of them went in, and our first loss 2 0. And Panish got a uh, very, very severe injury that uh, will take him out until the rest of season or most of rest of season. And it just seemed like nothing's going right. Yeah, this might be the first game. That maybe has made me, you know, believe in in a god, in a football god, because it seemed that all the luck that RFS sort of got last year uh, when they got to the conference group stage seemed it's just being redeemed now in 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 the opposite way. So many chances, and especially I think there were three times when the ball sort of hit was hit off the post and then on the line and either caught by the goalkeeper or. Uh, booted out by the defender and it's just wow 20 corners RFS took 20 corners during this game and not scored once with all the ridiculously tall players that they have and RFS are notoriously dangerous of set pieces and just nothing exactly just very very unlucky definitely were the better team that game but uh, well also fair play to Saba uh even though they, well, got lucky. They did score two goals, used sort of little mistakes from RFS and defended heroically as well. Again, with a lot of luck, but um, can't take that away from them. And it's just sad because, yeah, so many chances. It's it's tough to see because it's not really RFS as well. It's usually them that score a lot of goals. They rarely win like 1-0, 2-0. They, they, they score and score. So this was just... Yeah, well, I wasn't there, but I, I can honestly believe about the mournfulness after the game. Just oof, tough, tough. And I think both goals came from the left flank for Saba. And you could see that in the stadium, that somehow they managed to cut through the middle of the field and cut through the left flank, so RFS's right wing, fairly easily. It, it seemed like there there's an extra man there all the time. And I think both goals came from there. And um, noteworthy for, for the Azeri team, this was uh, their European debut. This was the first time ever they played in Europe, and they won. So obviously congratulations to them. Genuinely didn't play bad. They, they played pretty good, they were quick. They they clearly prepared tactically well. One thing I have an issue with is just after scoring the second goal, just the, the comical amount of time wastage and this just simulation. Other than that, all the credit to them. They they went head to head with a team that uh, that played in the in the conference league group stage last year and. Uh, they converted their chances, and that's what it comes down to. Time wasting, of course, part of the game, and if the roles were reversed, well, obviously. No, no, I get that, but just how comical it was. It that's I know, the, I know. The it's thing a, there. I think that's really the thing with these sort of teams from Balkan regions and Azerbaijan, whatever, because I, I, it, they are more shameless. Let's say that just shameless. Yeah, they they know what they're doing, and they sort of take joy in it. It seems like. Uh, so yeah, I can definitely agree. And uh, yeah, then the second game comes. Uh, a lot of work to do. But for you know, there was there was faith. There was faith even after the first game because I think because of how unbelievable this was, there was a lot of faith that RFS are going to turn this around. Yeah, definitely wasn't 
unrealistic. Before the game, I didn't really feel that much hope, but I thought RFS with their experience and and uh, sort of the character, they could do it. But unfortunately, another game where it, I wouldn't say all went wrong, but it was just it just wasn't there. Uh, starting with the red card for Zuzins in the 33rd minute, that was really just the biggest blow. Uh, a lot of people would probably wrote off the game after that, uh, but uh, they did manage to, to take the lead. Iconic scored a wonderful goal, just just very lovely. I think it, I'm surprised it didn't really go around you know, social media more because uh, if you really think about the technique uh, of that goal, well. It's incredible, but uh, unfortunately, yeah, to Sabah managed to score two goals back, sort of caught RFS defense out, but it makes sense because they had to go all out attack. And again, I don't think RFS played bad, especially considering they were a man down. But just it, the luck just wasn't on their side; it wasn't all there. Uh, Moros, the coach, also got a red card, so also it gets harder to play. And the, I'd say, painfully, that overall, I guess the the tie on aggregate, it's a fair result. Well, I wouldn't say fair result, the fair winner, but the result for one is definitely too harsh. And yeah, it just seemed for me that RFS sort of all the luck they had last year, it was just just went the opposite way this year, unfortunately. Yeah, seems like a disappointing outcome to their European campaign this season going from group stage to second qualification round. But, uh, I mean, what can you do? Just need to secure that Champions League spot and then play against the likes of Trepen and, uh, you know, it's just... it's it, People say that it's uh, so much easier to get to those places from, you know, these advanced positions, either if you're starting from the third qualification round or straight from playoffs or if you go the Champions League route and it's not always as evident that that's the case but uh, the sample that we have on Latvia this year is just it's it's I mean you you if you're blind you're gonna see this like the games Valmira is getting and the games that uh, the other three teams are getting is just you can you can see the advantage of approaching it not from you know qualification round one in fact i'm not sure that any team in the brief history of conference league ever managed to get into the group stage from the first qualification round yeah i wouldn't be surprised if that was the case uh no i, th- I think you're right uh, well i'm not sure i haven't heard anything but just logically it seems that this pro- there probably isn't a team that managed to get there from the first round uh, but yeah uh, as what what you said about the sort of the advanced position of being the champions and starting Champions League, uh, yeah, hap- well, what happened this year is exactly what was predicted. I think everyone was thinking in that, especially after Valmier sort of sold or, or let's say lost their best players from last year, everyone was thinking that if RFS or Riga was in the position Valmier is in, uh, they're going to the group stage, and the, I think now it's it's very obvious. Both RFS and Riga could have beaten uh, Olympia, I think, easily, because even Valmiera sort of had a chance. But even if not, then Trapena, easy, Balkan should be easy for Riga, RFS. But it wasn't to be, and, uh, well, that's part of Latvian football, because also getting to the group stages last year for RFS was sort of a blessing and a curse, because, yeah, it, it got car harder in the league, and they couldn't secure another championship. And yeah, that's how the sort of snowball rolls and rolls, and this happens. But uh, well, well, that's football. And as you said, yes, RFS fortunately did lose. Um, yeah, not the most successful of campaigns. But uh, the thing about RFS is that well, they're a club that's trying, they are trying to be um, well, sustainable and um, sort of not really change year by year. Such well, like Valmir <laughs> this year. So I'm sure they're going to be fine. And, uh, well, the, of course, depends where they finish in the league. But either way, next year should be fine again. It's not a tragedy. I'm a little bit concerned how that will affect their budget for the upcoming year. Because, uh, as you said, they're trying to be sustainable, not in, only in terms of squad composition, but also in terms of finances. And 
yeah, they have an established and successful um, company behind them as the main sponsor, but uh, the the guy behind that has said in an interview that the after winning the league, uh, the next step is to try to make the club uh, financially viable. And I, I mean, given I, I don't know what's the money situation from winning the Virus League or the Cup, uh, RFS doesn't really do many transfers or not like big ticket items like Krolis with uh, Valmira. Uh, I th- I suspect that the revenue from the Conference League was probably counted on. Second round, that's what, like 300k, I think, overall. I, I don't remember exactly. But, I mean, it's not a lot for a club that is the second most valuable club in, in the country. So I hope that's not going to have... A, too much of an adverse effect on the development of the organization as such because it doesn't seem like the people behind the club are willing to just throw money into it and to never look back like a different club from Riga does and um, you know these things can snowball both ways you can be a, a victim of your success and uh, you know good results bring a lot of money or equally you can uh, fall into this downward spiral where the squad doesn't develop, RFS is an old squad, players retire or move on, and then you can't really replace them with uh, sufficiently high-quality players, and then that further impacts you. Yeah, um, yeah. And another thing I wanted to sort of add is that another sort of one thing that I'm a bit sad about, well, uh, besides the fact that they lost, is that they lost both games, so no uh, points for the coefficient for for Latvia in the, in the European rankings that's also a bit sad if they got at least a draw well it still wouldn't go through but at least extra 0.125 points but uh, well of course they don't think about that they think about themselves and what happened happened and I think yeah we can move on to the next fixture which was uh, the debutants in the, on the European stage Auda uh, the Latvian Cup winners who started from the, from this round, second round, uh, who played it against uh, Spartak Trnava, Slovakian team. Uh, quite a, well, I'd say, the relatively you know popular team with a, with 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 some history. I believe they played once in, in the semi final of a European. Well, your I think it was called just European Cup back then. For Champions League. They just celebrated their 100th birthday by playing a friendly with Valencia just oh, before yeah. the game with Auda. Yeah, that as well. Valencia. So, Latvian clubs never sort of bringing such names in, in their friendlies. Uh, but yeah. I mean, g- give it give it 70 more years and <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. yeah. If, if, if any of the clubs last that long. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, what I sort of hate about this fixture is that, well, with a bit of luck, but Auda really made at least me believe after the first game that they actually had some chance. Because before the first game, I thought, well, they're definitely going to fight, but there's no way they, they go through. And then the first game, in front of their own fans in Skonto Stadium, they managed a 1 1 draw, which, of course, as I said, with a bit of luck, because Spartak had an early red card, and of course that changed the the dynamic of the game. All the were with the ball most of the time and attacking, but uh, couldn't really find their goal. But eventually did, and yeah, one one very emotional game, uh, very good emotions. Of course, uh, first game not losing against an opponent that was definitely a favorite, and. Uh, I was definitely surprised with the result, and uh, even though I still had little hopes, there was some, and I really thought that if they sort of hang in there in the second game, maybe, maybe something happens, but unfortunately it wasn't to be a uh, convincing win for Spartak 4-1, but still overall, I can't say that Auda sort of left a bad taste in my mouth after these both, uh, both games. They did what they could do, and... Uh, I mean, at least they got one draw, some points for the coefficient as well. So, I mean, our hope for them when we were recording the last episode, the previous episode, was that they don't lose the home game. So, in that sense, they have 
met the very high expectations. So I, I think Auto performed exactly as uh, as we had hoped it would. Because you said that you just hope it's not going to be three 0 in first uh, first half in Skonto, and no, it was one one. So it's good five two on aggregate. Yeah, not bad. I think a very decent debut for this team on the European stage. Yeah, also just um, they were also a bit unlucky with sort of the squad choices because Isayevs was injured and was subbed off after first half of the first game and couldn't play the second game, which I think is a shame because I think he's the main figure. Well, maybe Mikulic, but uh, one of the main figures in the defense. Minkovic, Korotko, also good players, but sort of Isaias, more experienced one and more of a leader, I believe. Uh, but not that well, if he played, it would make too much of a difference. Um, still probably would have lost. Yeah, it's just a shame that they conceded three goals in the first half and it, it was really just over after the first one. Could have at least still carried it on to the second half and maybe then we lose hope. But uh, still, it was to be expected and at least they managed to score in both games. That's also a nice achievement. Uh, at least didn't go and dry both games. So something nice to take take from these games. And as you said, it's a debut. So what more can we really ask from them? Yeah, and I think they lined up something along the lines of 5-4-1, if I remember correctly. So it was very obvious that it's going to be, a, you know, a counter-attack heavy game. And um, that just didn't really lead to much. Yeah. Also, what's good is that if Alder is really sort of here to stay in terms of this league and Latvian football, then it's also just a good experience for the club to know how these things work and... Uh, uh, I think we were lucky enough that the, we the, the Aude took their guy, uh, who well, Grians as he's known in the social media, to make these vlogs about both games. Uh, so he vlogged even both days separately uh, in the away trip as well, and it was just a nice insight in how the club sort of works and the players and the administration part of it. And it seemed that they're sort of all, for the debut. It seemed just very professional, very thought through, I think, uh, when other clubs like RFS, or FC first started, even Valmir, their sort of European, uh, their first European steps were just not that professional, I, I, I guess. And it seemed that they were just new to this and it was obvious, but for out it seemed that they know that they're, what they're doing. And overall, just, yeah, just just good, good experience. Scored goals, managed to manage a draw. And uh, yeah, if they manage to get in Europe next season as well, I'd be definitely more hopeful. Of course, depending on how the score, the team plays towards the end of the season, start of the next year. But overall, yeah, as a, as an organization and as a club, I think they've proved themselves on the positive side here. So that's that's really the best we can hope for, I'd say. Yeah, and then the final game was Riga FC versus Kecskemet uh, from Hungary. First uh, leg took place in Hungary, away, and Riga lost that 2-1. In fact, they almost lost it 2-0, but uh, on 86th minute, the newcomer, Anthony Contreras, pulled one back, thus maintaining hope, and the game was pretty even. You know, if we're, if we're talking about how it actually went, Riga didn't dominate in any way, but neither did Kecskemet. And then uh, they came back on August 3rd to Skonto and uh, started things off pretty badly, conceding a goal in seventh minute. But then, well, maybe you tell the tale of Riga. <laughs> well, first of all, I can definitely say it was, I, I think it was the best game I've seen live. Just because of sort of the 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 scenario of it and the emotions around it, it was yeah started off yeah just just poorly. I think I was still in line to get in when they conceded. I didn't even know they conceded. I was watching the live, then I had to scan the tickets, went into the stadium, and oh, it's one nil. <laughs> and yeah, then looked back and it was just yeah, Purinch made a mistake and just really not what you want in the start of the game when they need to to score. And at that point, RFS had already, I think they hadn't lost yet, but they had the red card and 
I think it was already quite hopeless for them. Aoda had lost, and on, well, I don't remember really the sort of the sequence of it, but uh, yeah. Uh, Aoda were down 3 0 before the start of the game, and RFS were, yeah, still 0 0, but uh, I think with the red cards just before the kickoff. I remember because I, I met uh, the Latvian footy in English account person. Yeah. <laughs> And so we had a quick chat about how Auda is doing, and then later I met the another person who's covering Latvian football in English. The, the account is MM Footy News, I think. And then we had a chat about um, RFS, and I, I recall telling him that I'm more nervous for Riga than I am for RFS in terms of proceeding to the third round. Mm. So RFS were still nil nil. I was kind of like, come on, it's, it's time to score already it's like 30th minute and then there was a red card and the portal that i was checking the game through showed incorrectly that the red card is not uh, for Zuzins but for Illich for some reason which was really puzzling the Illich is not the person who gets red cards and what, what's going on there but yeah so that was the the, the situation then and then Riga started, Purinch made a completely bizarre decision to play with his legs, but then didn't really. And uh, the Kesh Schemet attacker managed to block the clearance and then pass the ball to his body, and then they converted to 1-0, and everyone's very confused about it. Well, sad times after that, but sort of eventually Riga picked up their game, started to attack more. Uh, but I couldn't just couldn't convert. But already in the first half, one person really sort of stood out. Uh, Gutierrez Mankenda. He was a lot with the ball and on the right side and just doing his dribbles that he was known for before in Liepāja. And uh, he was just playing with the left back of Ketchkemet. That uh, it was definitely just a long day for him. Um, but yeah, just couldn't convert even though we had chances. But then the second half came and. Uh, Again, attacking a lot, couldn't score, but yeah, then then the ma- ma- magic that Mankenda produced really became fruitful and took on a player, made a very, very nice cross, which uh, Muzinga, the le- I think they were both right wing backs, left wing backs that game. I think there were three center backs for Riga, and uh, yeah, scored the header and then it really just took off. Riga were attacking a lot and the crowd was. I just really enjoyed the emotions. Just every time Riga was with the ball, especially Mankenda was with the ball, the crowd was just cheering, cheering on very loudly. I think for a Latvian team, it's it's a very rare sight. So that was just so nice to see. Yeah, but they couldn't score, even though they had multiple chances. I think Dashkovic pretty much missed an open goal. I think it was Peña or Contreras might have even bumped into him and, and they couldn't really divide the ball. And uh, yeah, it was just painful to see. But then in the, the dying minutes of the game, the Mankenda scored after assisting and also then scored and just a lovely goal. Especially props to Bosancic, the center back who left the ball between his legs. It was I was also surprised to see it was him because he's a center back and rarely sort of is in the attacking positions and gets to sort of be cheeky. But Mankenda scored and uh, I listened back to the commentators who commented at that game and there's the reaction to the goal, and uh, you could hear Novitsky Sedmunds losing his voice, and they were they were just screaming, and yeah, just emotions that you rarely see in Latvian football, and uh, yeah, two one, extra time. Oh, and even after two one, immediately Riga was on the attack again, and Pena hit the post, and they could have finished it off there and then, but uh, yeah, extra extra time, and Riga was on such a high that I I was sure they were gonna go through. Unless it went to penalties, I thought. I think I thought in penalties they would probably lose, but managed to somehow win in the dying, well, again dying minutes. The uh, the added time of all people, El Bashir and Gom took a free kick. First of all, center back taking free kicks, and I hadn't seen him taking one ever. I think, and somehow he, yeah, just hit it lovely. It bounced before around the sort of penalty area, and uh, bounced up, and in the top corner and uh, it was just scenes after that just all the players running even though subbed off not not only players staff everything everyone just on the pitch laughing screaming and uh, well i can definitely say i lost my voice after the game 
it was just full of emotions and such a comeback is well rarely seen in Latvia. I think RFS sort of did that last year, but it was away, unfortunately. Yeah, it was just wow and uh, just unbelievable to see, especially because also because of the extra time. I think Kachkmet also had one uh, good chance in this extra time, and Purinj did made a very good save, which is also a props to him after making such a mistake. That's why I like him because even though he has mistakes in him, he's very sort of confident and I think calm, and uh, yeah, he can sort of carry on without thinking of the of the of his mistake and uh, yeah. In the end, Riga de- definitely deservedly won and uh, got through. Uh, but ju- just the manner of it and the sort of the emotions just made it better. Which is interesting because realistically, on paper, they should have won more easily and more confidently. But, well, they put on a show for us and uh, can't really complain about that. Well, I had the distinct privilege of, uh, again, being able to enjoy the game out of the media space. And from there, I mean, yeah, it, it's a it's a slightly different experience because you don't really have that many people around you, and the people who are around you, they're there to work, so they don't really participate in the game emotionally. Most people have their computers with them, and it's kind of no no one's singing any songs or even clapping for events. So it's a little bit of a not really like watching the game on TV by yourself kind of an experience, but somewhere in between that and being live. But even there, once uh, Mankanda scored that goal in the 95th minute, I mean, just the tension and the excitement, you could cut it with a knife. It started raining by that point pretty heavily as well in Riga. And it's just nail-biter. If I think there is no better way to put it. That's that's what it was, if, if there ever was one. I was already also thinking that if it goes to penalties, I don't think Riga are in a good place. Stipic already prepared a sub. Matrovic was about to uh, come on. Oh, Big goalkeeper. Right. Yeah, yeah, he was ready to come on specifically for for penalties because Purin is, uh, is not a big frame kind of a goalkeeper. And uh, and and then that goal by El Bashir, which I, I managed to catch on video because I was I was trying to be a, a responsible person with respect to my press accreditation, so I'm trying to like film every set piece. And uh, if you want to see it, if you haven't seen it, it's on our Instagram page in the highlighted stories. So the the moment, and if you do go and check it out make sure that the sound is on because Skonto just it just went bananas it was crazy and you can see what you were talking about everyone's just running out on the pitch and celebrating it's fantastic yeah it's just just uh, a football football festival things that you know people love this game for it was all there coming in from behind in front of your home fans very dramatic fashion, literally in last seconds, uh, Kershkema tried to play the ball out quickly while Riga were still celebrating and tried to, uh, you know, to score in an empty net, but uh, the referee closed those attempts down and then basically once the game restarted, it immediately ended. There was a final whistle and Riga threw to qualification around three. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's a different story. The story of Skonto that night in in this pouring rain, I was just uh, that's that's the kind of games that you know Stipish is talking about creating heritage for Riga FC. That's that's one of the main ingredients for that games like that that make you believe in the team, make you believe in that when you go to the stadium, it's gonna be yeah. worth it. And uh, as you said, it had everything the game and even. Yeah, exactly. When you mentioned the rain, I started to think about it. I also had a moment where I sort of just looked around and took it in that it's sort of nighttime already, almost full Skonto Stadium, very good football game. And, you know, the sort of the rain combined with the floodlights, it's just, just such a nice look and such a nice, because it wasn't a heavy rain, it was just sort of trickling down and it was just, just a lovely, lovely, as you said, atmosphere and just the feeling. And also it had sort of the, the one-man show as well, which is always good for these games. This sort of one star player that stood out, Mankenda, how many times he took on on, on on the players and not only took on, but also sort of ran back to the other side 
from where he's supposed to be to sort of help Riga get the ball back uh, before their own penalty box and did that successfully and took on two players sort of, I don't even know how, just before they he scored, before they got the corner, how he got around the second player, I just don't understand. He's, he didn't even flick the ball uh, around him. It was just sort of, just somehow happened and he sort of fought his way through. And yeah, and especially because we saw Mankenda in Riga shirt in previous games and he just didn't really stand out. It wasn't bad, but just wouldn't expect him to be the hero of the match and all well, well, he was. And what I also like to see is that I think finally Riga have sort of found uh, their sort of transfer strategy, I guess, because previously they've had a lot of foreign players that just seemed there, there for the money and uh, towards the end of their career. And first of all, Jojic, who could be such a player, is definitely not one. The, the passion he still has and hard work he's doing is admirable. And I really liked also Contreras, the way he was just running around and putting tackles in in, in the sort of the attacking area and not letting them sort of get the ball out was also just impressive to see and inspiring as well uh, that he fought so hard. He hasn't really... Well, it makes sense he needs his place in the squad, etc. But uh, yeah, the whole team was just on it. And I'd say also a very smart thing Stipic did was uh, subbing Ngom on in the first half because, yeah, Musa wasn't really cutting it. And uh, yeah, just with Ngom on the, on the pitch, the whole defense is... Much more confident, him, Boshancic and Sergio Mordis is uh, a very good trio of defenders. Somehow, yeah, they just did it. Uh, by looking at stats, of course, they were also dominating. And as you said, Stipic making the heritage with the club is definitely a good, wouldn't say start, but good, good path that he's taking, even if they don't go through the next round, which is quite unlikely that they do. Uh, it's They still produce these fantastic emotions that... That this is just the reason we love football for. And uh, yeah, even though I'm not, like, I wouldn't say I'm like a fan of Riga, I just like all the Latvian clubs, especially when they play in Europe. And uh, I'm not even on the pitch or anything, but even I was just stressing through throughout the extra time. And I was thinking that, why, why am I stressing? Nothing changes in my life depending on the result. But I thought, well, apparently I love Latvian football so much that even I'm stressing about, about the outcome of the game. And it's just a pleasure to see. So uh, against Vikingur, I think there were, I, I don't recall off the top of my head, but it was around 5,000 people in Skonto. Uh, I think like maybe yeah, just a I little think bit, something like, like that. 4.7 yeah. maybe, uh, yeah. Then uh, RFS um, game against uh, Macedonia GP in Sloka. I was like two-thirds full stadium there or something like that then RFS versus Saba in Sloka I don't have the numbers I don't think they announced that during the game but it it felt pretty full yeah you can't see again I, I again had the pleasure of enjoying it from the from the media space which you know but every direction I looked at there were people including quite a few of uh, fans from Azerbaijan and the VIP lounge, which is right behind the, the press area, I mean, it was <laughs> just completely packed to the brim. And then Skonto now, for the Cash Kmet game, and I remember the, the number because it's such a... It's easy to remember. There were 5,533 people. So, and uh, remember the big Riga derby was also just north of uh, 5,000 so we're now pretty regularly clocking for these bigger games or these international games uh, around 5,000 people going to see Latvian teams play. Last season for the Conference League group stage, RFS sold out every home game in Skonto. And that's, that's just such an important and heartwarming thing to witness. That It's not like, I don't know, 1,000 people show up and it's a big deal. Or like in our friends in Estonia, their their largest ever attendance was like 3,000 something not too long ago. Maybe with... Uh, that's another good thing about the Conference League though, right? Because th there is this another European competition that teams who are not from like the top 20 leagues have a good uh, chance to progress in. 
and it attracts more interest to the game in, in the countries that don't have the resources and tradition of, um, of the larger neighbors or neighbors that uh, you know, weren't occupied for a while and could develop their football. So it's 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 only I can see only benefits and yeah, it's so much just fun. It's nice to see sort of Latvian football community growing and people going to games more and more. And yeah, and even the Riga against Liepāja in Virsliga, there was I think around 2000 people there. So yeah, and the, the more we get that in Virsliga as well, that's really what we of course want to see, but uh of course European games attract more attention and people come, but uh it's not. It's definitely not always just people who regularly watch or follow football. Just some people also just interested in the game, and that's what you want to see. Yeah. In the game against Vikingur, I actually bumped into one of my work colleagues, and he was there with uh, like his cousins who were visiting from abroad or something like that. Both uh, <laughs> kitted out in Riga shirts. Yeah. So. Exactly. There you go. It's a it's a wonderful thing. And yeah, then. Uh, that's uh, us done about all the games, and now uh, we can sort of touch upon the next round uh, where Valmer and Riga will be competing in. Much harder work to do for Riga, of course, as they're facing Twente from uh, Netherlands, the Eredivisie. Uh, by now, it's a top five uh, Europe, European league uh, by the, the coefficients, which shows a lot. I, I believe it's, it's France that they've pushed out, right? Correct, yeah. France is number six now. Yeah, the the Farmers League, as many people like to call it. Uh, France? And, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Apparently, that's that's the way people look at it. And uh, yeah, this is going to be just, again, a big football festival, definitely in Skonto Stadium, because first uh, fixture is in Netherlands, so uh, the second game where everything sort of is decided is in Riga, and I uh, already know it's going to be just huge, and I, I just hope that it's not decided in the first game already um, because, yeah, away from home against such a team, it's going to be very hard for Riga. I can't really see them winning the first game. Maybe, maybe finding out for a draw, but I, I more likely like a 1-0, 2-0 loss. But then at home, it's definitely a higher chance for them. At home, they're always better. And I think the support that's been there the previous games, I think... I wouldn't. I I I I quite confidently say that at least half of the people that were the catch game and game will now want to go to the twenty game just because of the emotions they felt and who wouldn't want to relive it. So I think we can really count on the support in Skonto Stadium, and uh, who knows what can happen. I I definitely don't think they 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 are gonna go through, but I I will always have just a little hope because. You know, it's two games, anything can happen, and if Riga really can put their best squad out, maybe, maybe. But overall, it's just going to be nice to bring such a huge team to, to, to Latvia, to Riga. And uh, as long as they don't embarrassingly lose, which I don't think they will, then it uh, should be fine either way. But, well, who knows, who knows. Yeah, we'll see. Need to park that bus in the Netherlands, and then uh, take the... That... You know, make sure that the decisive game is indeed in Riga. But this is already this week, um, so not too long left to find out. And then the return game is next week. Um, it's the other way around for Valmira. Valmira are playing this week against uh, Albanian champions Partizani, and then they're playing away next week. But because um, in Valmira their main stadium is lacking lighting, I think... Or maybe there's some other... Probably some other as well. But lighting is definitely a big part of it. They're going to play in Skonto. So there's going to be a, a weekly European level game in Skonto for two more weeks. Which is pretty cool. But um, yeah, no, in terms of Riga versus Twente, obviously a formidable opponent. I've, I saw a friendly that Twente played against Schalke just recently and yeah no the i mean the individual mastery of players in terms of even ball control and how how much accuracy they can generate with you know things like long range efforts and such you can really tell the difference between you know where we are and where these top 5 leagues are but you know hopefully 
some healthy dose of underestimation for the home game and then maybe a bit of luck for, for the away game. Anything can happen, as you said. In terms of Valmir and Partizani, Valmir has been gutted, which uh, makes me a little bit concerned. Well, quite a lot concerned about this. But at the same time, Partizani, yeah, they're Albanian champions, but Albania is number 48 in UEFA coefficient rankings. We are currently at number 33. There's quite a bit of space in between Latvian League and Albanian League. So then the question is, is number three in Latvia stronger than number one in Albania? And I genuinely cannot answer that because I don't really know much about Partizani or how they play or what they're all about. I know that the squad value is about the same as Valmira. For Twente, the team alone is more valuable than the entire Vierce League, I think, or just about the same. Right, so it's very much a David versus Goliath, even if uh, David is the richest team in, in their own respective uh, environment. But I don't know, Partizani fans, what, what I've seen from social media, they seem to be supremely confident that they're going to brush Valmir aside. And I'm I'm genuinely un, unsure why that's the case. Is it the, a degree of ignorance of Latvian football, which could very well be? Is it just, uh, you know, talking smack? Fair enough. But we'll see. I think Valmir should make an effort to go through. And I think given the draws they're getting, it would be a borderline criminal to not challenge for the group stage. Because, as you said in the beginning of the episode, if Rigor or RFS were in Valmir's shoes this year, I mean, we would be booking tickets, well, not anywhere yet, but proverbially, to whoever is in the group stage. It's, it's just it's such a such a walk through the garden, it seems like. Yeah. With Valmira, yeah, unclear, unclear. They Their last game in Virsliga, they won, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything dominant. We'll talk about it in different episodes. So it's unclear how the team will, what it will look like, how it will perform, what it can or cannot do. Hopefully the 10-0 win will put a healthy dose of confidence into the squad. And then they should go through. Yeah, it's interesting Yeah, that the Albanians seem confident to go through. Maybe Partizan is now like a giant giant in Albania. Uh, I'm really not sure about that. Yeah, it is interesting. And also figuring that, as Count said, the, the, the 10-0 against Rapenis should sort of scare the opponents. But maybe if they sort of... If they really uh, studied what Trepene is, then they don't really see anything of the 10 nil, which, uh, to be fair, is fair and that's how it should be. Uh, but yeah, I actually kind of like that Valmir. I don't like that Valmir is gutted, as you said, and just skimmed of their best players. But I like the fact that if they weren't, I would be very sort of confident and well, not confident, but I would I would think more that well, Valmir should have this. And win this and go through, even though it's probably going to be hard. But now, because they're a worse team on paper, um, I just have this feeling of, I just don't know. They probably won't go through, but still could. And it actually makes me feel a bit better, because it's it's just easier to sort of go in this without high expectations. Uh, which, of course, I, if, even though I see it as a positive, overall it is a negative. Uh, but at least I won't be like sad if, if they lose because there's not that much expectation. Uh, but yeah, it should be a close game. Partizani, as I looked, are just a slight, slight favorites. But I mean, yeah, Valmir could do something. And if all the players that they still have do play their best game, they should go through. But yeah, it's just that their players are just very, very shaky and uh, inconsistent. Such players as Skarmani. The op, and uh, yeah, it's just just their central midfield is is definitely the the the, the weak link of the team. Uh, defense is all right, but in attack they can do good. But uh, yeah, it's it's gonna be interesting. And uh, if it's weird because Valmir are, are definitely more likely to go through, but somehow the uh, maybe it's just the recency bias because of the catch game, but somehow just the high that Riga is on 
somehow makes me believe that maybe they can do something, although also unlikely. One one is for sure that I, I I'd say with 99% confidence that there is is not going to be a Latvian team in the group stages this uh, this this European season, unfortunately, because the draws for draws for the next round if they go do go through uh, are looking even even more hopeless. But I mean, all all we can do is hope and sort of look forward to what happens. And...